Well, let's be honest, it's not the most unreasonable question to be asking yourself. You'd be forgiven for wondering just that after what was an absolute calamity at Autodesk University 2022 in New Orleans last year. But mate, it's in the past now, right? So is the pandemic, the coof, it's done, mate, it's finished. It's officially been consigned to the headlines of our history books and all the proper live in-person events. They're back on the menu, mate, they're up and running. And up next for Autodesk was their Automotive Innovation Forum in Frankfurt, Germany last week. So nowhere near as high profile as Autodesk University, right? That normally sees around 10,000 attendees. But this one, you get around 500 to 600 of the world's most talented automotive designers, right? Design chiefs, visualization artists, and executives from the likes of Porsche, Audi, BMW, Jaguar Land Rover, Mercedes, Volkswagen, right? All the big OEMs, they all descend into the Sheraton Airport Hotel this year to nerd out over car stuff. And so, so did I. I was there. Initially, so quite scratching about in the dark, right? Lurking in a corner, peering through a window at, <laughs> at how the other half live, being all envious of all these people with literally the coolest jobs on the planet. But then, much to my surprise, Autodesk somewhat nervously decided to let me in. <laughs> Sweat dripping from their brow, no doubt, as that guy who made that video was now in the building. But real quick, mate, what even is this event? Well, the Automotive Innovation Forum, or AIF for short, is basically Autodesk University, but specifically and exclusively for the automotive industry. You've got the usual stuff going on, right? Like main stage keynote presentations, informative classes held by industry leaders. You've got a tech center area, like with exhibitors and sponsors, but all in, mate, it's a gathering of people entirely from one industry, all coming together to discuss the current state of their industry, talk about trends and where they reckon things are heading in the future. And one thing struck me quite hard right from the get go, mate, because you've got all these executives and designers from competing OEMs, right? All in one area. So worst care, I just had this vision in my head of like, I don't know, it all descending into chaos, like mixing menthols and coke or sticking a bunch of Newcastle and Sutherland fans or Rangers and Celtic fans into a room and just saying, right, crack on, mate. All right, needing some kind of riot team to maintain order. Or best case, everyone would just split up. Like, like at a, you know, like opposing families at a wedding party all sat on their own tables chatting amongst themselves and not mixing. But no, no, couldn't be further from the truth, mate. It was almost like everyone were besties there. It was so weird how open and collaborative the whole event was. I mean, don't get me wrong, right? They're not all sat there around a campfire singing Kumbaya, sharing technical blueprints and drunkenly disclosing all their trade secrets. But in some ways, some kind of were. And it was really refreshing to see. You could argue, though, when they do that, it's a bit of an opportunity to flex on each other. Like, look at what we're doing, look how good we are and <laughs> keep up with us kind of a thing. But take Porsche, for example. On the main stage, they gave a super interesting presentation on how they use Autodesk Shotgun as the backbone for a digital material library of assets that they use in V-RED. It's a central common interface that they've designed themselves for building all of their viz scenes using pre-approved assets that fit the current design language. And they were just totally fine with just sharing that in a room full of their competitors, which I just found absolutely awesome. And we had some pretty inspiring characters on stage, right? We had the likes of Ehab Kahood, who is one of the, or if not the, I don't know, chief designer for Ford, who's been designing cars for longer than most people in the audience have even been alive. And then after spending about that same amount of time showing us his iPad sketched self portraits on stage for some reason, uh, he then went on to share some of his numerous experiences and accolades, like how he'd led the team responsible for the Ford F-150 and how he was responsible for one of my favorite cars that I've ever owned, this one here. Personally love this car, the Ford Focus ST from the mid 2000s. Freaking love that car. It was just fascinating to see the guy responsible for it after I owned it myself. But the overall theme of his talk was about how disruptive AI could become in automotive design with us being shown what looked like mid-journey or stable diffusion generated vehicle designs and how that could be a big influence in vehicle design moving into the future. Then we had Dr. C oh mate, Sigmar Hassis, former CIO of R&D at Mercedes-Benz. He went on to discuss a value-driven digital transformation on the main stage and there was tons of stuff like this going on. Didn't catch it all, couldn't possibly include it all here anyway but plenty of insights from all kinds of automotive legends who've ultimately, one way or the other, mate, had some kind of impact on what we drive or how we engage with transport over the course of our lives. But one presentation that stood out for me and I found really insightful and unique was a live on-stage 
customer vehicle configuration demo by Aston Martin using the ridiculously outrageous Valkyrie supercar. So this was Aston Martin showing how they use V-Red, you know, that 14 grand a year, might be 15 grand a year now, uh, license thing that I did a, what the fuck is this kind of video on uh, last year, I'll link that up here. Well, how they use V-Red live with the very wealthy customer to configure the car and then present the end product to them in real time. So the customer can pick the wheels, the, the colors, and then Vred's just updating a photorealistic render of it in real time. I found this to be the standout one for me because first of all, it, it was just fascinating seeing all the ways Vred could be used in a proper high-end production use case, but we also heard some interesting anecdotes about the Valkyrie itself, direct from Aston Martin, like how they had to obtain special dispensation from the UK's DVLA because the, they needed a unique license plate material on the back of the car because that exhaust mate hits up to 900 degrees Celsius, enough to actually melt the regulation license plate so they had to get a special material to be used. And if by chance you want to see this actually being done in the real world, one of the very lucky 150 people able to afford an owner Valkyrie is it's a YouTuber called James Walker or Mr. JWW. And I watched this four years ago. It's funny how things come around, but he made a video four years ago showing him using V-Red along with its VR integration at Aston Martin as he spec'd up his own Valkyrie, which I think he only took delivery of it two weeks ago. <laughs> four years later, the car turns up. That's some patience, mate. But then when it did turn up, he made a one hour long delivery video, which takes you through tons of the engineering and intricacies of the Valkyrie. Highly recommended watch if you've got the time to go into that one. So over on the exhibit of floor, mate, we've got multiple screens showing all the new features in both V-Red and Alias. We had Silver Draft there with this real-time camera rigging system and some Lamborghini model with a backdrop thing that kind of made it look like there was a proper cinematic deal going on. We had Vario with uh, this red VR showcase with the Aston Martin Valkyrie CAD model with Vive trackers on it. And that was all powered by Lenovo's newest party piece, their P10 or PX workstation, which was apparently designed in collaboration with Aston Martin. Although, may I, just veering off into the realms of speculation in my opinion here, I remain skeptical on that deal because whatever, if any involvement that Aston Martin might have had, just because you design cars, mate, realistically, <laughs> what have you got to offer that hasn't already been done? by lots of very intelligent engineers over dozens of years in the time leading up to your crack at it. But cutting through all the expected marketing BS of breakthrough this and right, it's superior at that nonsense. From what I can see, there's nothing really notably new here in terms of innovation from Lenovo and this P10 workstation, other than them just cramming in the best of what Intel and Nvidia have got to offer today and then sticking it all into one box. Seems to be what was going on here. And this, to be fair, it's got some seriously high-end kit in it. Two Sapphire Rapids-based Intel Xeon 8490H CPUs. Each CPU has 60 cores and 120 threads a piece, making for a 240 total thread workstation and a cost of, check this out, $34,000 worth of CPUs. They're 17 grand each. And alongside those CPUs is 27 grand worth of four NVIDIA RTX A6000 ADA generation GPUs with I think 48 gigs of VRAM each, all needing two, yes, two, I think the 1800 watt power supplies, possibly higher, just to power this one workstation. Now I'm no electrical engineer, mate, but I'm pretty sure that won't be safe or possibly it might not even be legal to just be plugged into the socket under your desk when you've got that much wattage being drawn from the wall but there could potentially be a fundamental problem with that workstation. Now, I don't pretend to know the intricacies of PC communication, bus lanes and all that, but somebody who, who will remain nameless, but is far more intelligent than 40 Mr. Crosses, took a little whisper into my ear, mate, and he said that when you've got four GPUs and dual CPUs, so four graphics cards, two CPUs, and with the ADA generation of NVIDIA GPUs not having NVLink to link them all together, for the graphics cards to talk to each other, they need to communicate with each other. And that means when you've got two GPUs per CPU, they've got to talk to each other with the data crossing over and through the CPU interconnect, which can lead to a major bottleneck and latency on GPU intensive tasks. Sometimes potentially could make things worse than if you just had two GPUs, depends on what you're doing. Maybe Lenovo have thought about this. They've designed the P10 with all of this in mind, right? They knew they were going to have four graphic cards, two CPUs. They knew the interconnect was a problem and they designed around it. Got it covered, mate. Not a bother. Or, 
Alternatively, here's a thought. They were too busy whining and dining Aston Martin and thinking of all the ways that they could peacock the collaboration and make it sound special, and it just totally didn't get tested. Nobody thought of it. Don't know. It's not like it's it's not like it's unheard of for major OEMs to drop absolute howlers. Am I right, Dell? Anyway, Autodesk also showcased a new tape markup system for VR, which maps through into Alias, kind of like a, a reproduction of what clay modelers do when marking out design changes on a clay model. But last but not least, mate, by far for me, the most exciting takeaway from AIF in terms of software was what was coming later in VRED 2024. It's a point release later on in the year. Volumetric particle import. Now, right, before I get into this, I've no doubt fans of Blender and Unreal Engine will be like, eh, mate, come on, this is... This is not new, right? Blender and Unreal Engine and Unity, these have been doing this sort of stuff for years, particle systems. And you're right, it's not new. But when you take what Vred can already do, then add this to the mix, it's going to make for some absolutely incredible visuals and animations in Autodesk Vred. It is just a particle importer, right? The data needs to be generated first in software like sort of Embergen or Bifrost. But once Vred imports it, it looks friggin' phenomenal. And I cannot wait to waste hours of my life, my free time, just aimlessly driving dragging point lights through smoke just because just because it can. So huge props to the Vred team for continuing to be awesome. All in, AIF was, it was pretty good, mate. In fact, it was, I really enjoyed it. Certainly didn't have, nor did it really warrant the flair and extravagance that you tend to expect at the likes of Autodesk University, but it was, AIF was very well organized, very well catered for, good planning, no nonsense, it all went to plan, and it brought together what was clearly a close-knit community who felt more like one big family than a collection of competitors. Shout out to the guys at Audi and Porsche who recognized me from, well, from, from here. Uh, the guy from Man Trucks who, for some reason, wanted a selfie with me. <laughs> Sure, thanks. Uh, the Vred guys, Pascal, Lucas, Michael, Danny, Florian, Victor, and thank you massively as well to Sonia for not hiring a hitman to take me out over what I said about Autodesk University 2022. I didn't get, I wasn't lost on me. Uh, Marcus from Fujitsu, who I spent quite a bit of time with. If you want to pay me to make another video that we never actually release and never get seen, I'm all ears, mate. And uh, apologies if I've missed anyone else, but um, yeah, if Autodesk do put up highlights or videos from the event, I'll link them in the description down below. Thanks for watching, and hopefully with any luck, I'll see you at Autodesk University 2023. We're back in Vegas, baby. Toodles.